Dr. Philip Guo, or as we know him, P.G. Bovine, uh, teaches at UC San Diego in the Cognitive Sciences Department, affiliated with the Computer Science Department. And he received his bachelor's and master's degrees from MIT and his PhD from Stanford. Um, anything else about your bio you want me to share? Maybe people in the crowd have surprises. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's some um, undergrad friends who can tell some embarrassing stories. Maybe we'll start Coming with, the Q &A with your uh, All right, thank you so much, Mitch. Well, thank you everyone for, for coming. This is an awesome, I love this kind of like more intimate crowd. So I have about, my talk's around 45 minutes or so, but like, since it's such a small crowd, if you have questions, just like raise your hand and go like that so I can, I can see. So uh, today I want to talk about this, um, this concept called learning programming at scale that I've been working on for the past you know, I would say almost a decade or so. And you know, this is a uh, photo of a relief sculpture uh, studio in uh, this 1910 in Tokyo. So uh, these students are carving out relief sculptures and there's instructors kind of walking around supervising their models and everything. Um, this is a more contemporary clay sculpture studio, right? There's an instructor again, there's you know, a model here and everyone's carving out his head apparently. Um, woodworking, so it's like hobby spaces, maker spaces are filled with this sort of activity where people are like, you know, pairing up and, and working with these tools. It's like really, really hands on. Even more hands on, like literally hands on, is doing uh, ceramics and pottery. So, this is actually uh, from the Colorado Center for the Blind. So, these are actually visually impaired learners uh, doing, uh, doing pottery, which is really fascinating. So what all of these sorts of arts and crafts have in common is that they, they involve these really authentic, hands-on, real-time interactions uh, between people. And I, I would, you know, I, I would argue that it's hard doing computer programming and, and coding is like this, even though it may not seem like it, I think it's hard, it is like this, and it's best learned in this sort of studio craft sort of setting. So uh, some of y'all, I think, oh my god, is that in this picture? Yes, there we go. There's that. <laughs> this is 2004. Four cups bottom. This is my wow. senior at MIT. This is in the Athena clusters um, when we had these old sub microsystems machines. But um, so the computer labs around all of these universities and now increasingly high schools, coding uh, boot camps, you know, spaces like this are really where all the action takes place. Right? People are working in teams. They're kind of maybe they're instructors walking around. It's really kind of intimate hands-on experience. In modern day, a lot of things happen on laptops, right? People don't have these bulky desktops anymore. For the most part, they have monitors and laptops. But really, there's a lot of this pairing going on. This is even earlier. This is our, um, Xiao and our, our freshman year at MIT. Maybe Xiao is in this picture somewhere, like, hiding off screen. We'll recognize some people here. This is the really old labs um, back in 2001, 2002. And this is where instructional staff go around. And it's some time. Uh, instructional staff go around and, and help uh, people out. So this is where ideally we'd want to be learning programming, right? Like this is, you know, for, for people who are doing computer science in college, this is really where all that can happen. And as much as I think us professors want to think that, you know, we're, you know, <laughs> what we're teaching is, is actually getting through, I really think a lot of the real learning happens in these, these lab settings with TAs and other students and such. Um, but the thing is, most people who are trying to learn to code uh, around the world don't have access to any of this, right? I mean, uh, unless you're privileged enough to go to well-resourced universities or schools for this stuff, you really don't have access to these sorts of in-person settings. And you know, the, the, the research that I focus on a lot is this at-scale part, right? So like, one major area of my work is uh, kind of trying to address the question, how do people around the world learn programming without the benefits? <coughs> Of this in-person <laughs> all my papers available here it's all open access can just google for it but i'll give a brief super high level overview of a few of them so uh about a year or two ago i just i did this study about older adults learning to code and so i did this online survey and here's one you know, snippet from here so there's a 60 year old two year old woman from australia um, she's working as a, a document legal assistant and she said i wanted to learn programming so it's that to establish a new career and have some independence uh, but the most frustrating aspect of learning online is I do not have a teacher on a face-to-face -face basis, such as in a classroom environment, and this is appealing me greatly. So, you know, uh, you can learn, you know, we're not at a lack of materials, right? So the, the interesting thing about coding is that all this stuff is in theory online, it's open source, there's documentation, right? this is the Python standard library documentation. You can read all of this and you can, you know, you can try to figure this all stuff out on your own. And, this might seem cryptic to people who are, you know, somewhat familiar with English and technical vocabulary, but um, but 
I did a study also, this was the past year, about people who are not native English speakers. If you think about all the people around the world who are learning code, most of these resources are English, primarily English. So you know, we get quotes uh, and snippets like this. The technical vocabulary of learning programming. Link for can be complicated to simulate, especially if you don't know the equivalent word in your native language. All right. So you know, you can imagine Googling around for more stuff, right? And if you're learning web development, you might land on sites like W3 Schools with Pringles ads and air filter ads and like weird <laughs> pop-ups everywhere and like code snippets that haven't been updated in about a decade since I was learning. Um, and and you know, I, I, some colleagues might did another study about learning resources, about people trying to learn on their own and how these modern learning resources are just not well suited for self-learning. So there's you know quotes like this. You know, there's so much garbage on the internet. That if you search something that does not look like an incredible website, then I want to verify with the human being. So there's a, there's a lot of these themes about wanting human contact. So then we think about these MOOCs, these online courses, um, you know, Code Academy, Udemy, these sorts of online courses. You know, thinking about how we get human interaction in online setting are mostly through discussion forums, right, and Q and A sites. So we did this study a few years ago about studying forums and MOOCs, and the, the big takeaway from this is that novices have a hard time formulating questions, right? I mean, if you're trying to formulate a question about code, especially if you're writing in text form, you're often doing this, right? You're often just pasting in a bunch of code, <laughs> no formatting and such, right? But, but it's all not, you know, it's not always the onus on the novices. Uh, thinking on the other side about um, experts, we have everybody's favorite website, Stack Overflow. So this is, one, this is a study that got a lot of press about uh, the challenges, especially that, that uh, women face on online communities like Stack Overflow, which are, are not known to be the most friendly to, to, to many people. So, you know, one of the, the summaries we have here is, you know, have you seen some of the responses on there? And you can just dig around for all sorts of snarky responses, including what they're to say. They'll be the sound snarky, followed by some giant. Right, right. So, you know, this, you know, this, this is sort of the consequence, I think, of scaling learning, right? So one of the, I think, one of the status quo that we've begun to accept is that, yeah, you know, it would be great if everyone could be in a classroom or in a nice space like this, but, you know, this is the internet, you just go look for stuff, you might post some questions, we don't really have that human connection. And um, kind of the, the inspiration behind basically all my work is thinking about this. Think about how do we scale these authentic, hands-on, real-time learning interaction so that we can turn learning to code from all this, you know, scary walls of text to something more like that, right? And I want to talk about three different kinds of interactions that I've been uh, developing and, and deploying and uh, how they all fit into this, uh, this vision. So the first, there, there are three kind of key ideas here. So the first one's called discussing visual representations, connecting learners online, and making experts multitask. So I'll start with discussing visual representations. So once again, let's go back to the computer lab where all the action is. Um, let's see if I recognize other people. This is before Meacher's time, I might be. This is when you're still like this small. That it's only two years earlier. Um, you know, code is really opaque, right? So the word code even implies something very cryptic and opaque. So if you're not a programmer or a coder, code is actually looks kind of weird, right? So you have these weird symbols here, and, and they kind of fit together. And if you were to ask someone, what is going on here? Um, naturally, what people do is they start drawing diagrams. Like paper, 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 whiteboard, right? So they start drawing diagrams to figure out what's going on. And you might be starting to think about drawing a diagram in your head of what's going on here as well. Um, and in fact, you actually don't know what diagram is correct because I haven't told you what programming language is. Right? So depending on the language, the, the diagrams in your head will be different. So in order to facilitate this process and scale up, I've been working on this tool called the Python Tutor for the past about eight years or so. It started with Python, um, because that was a very popular language for teaching, it still is, but now it's actually expanded to a bunch of languages. So this is on the web, you can actually just play with it right now. Um, let's play the demo, and I'll narrow it. So you can write code with a bunch of languages, C++, JavaScript, Ruby, you can write, this is the simple example of the list, so the two lists. So when you hit visualize, it runs the code, and it produces visualization, so you can step forward one step at a time, and it shows you the diagram. So this is a diagram that an instructor would draw. You can go backwards as well. And in this way, you can kind of try to figure out and build mental models for, I'm going to go edit again, to build mental models for what you know, your code is doing. So uh, once again, you can kind of drag both ways. And the design of this tool, kind of, I don't have time to go into the technical details. I'd be love to geek out about this afterwards with folks. But the design of this tool is really trying to emulate like, what would an expert draw on the board, right? This is the kind of scale we're going for. It's like, instead of having someone manually draw for you have a tool kind of draw these diagrams and help you step through it to build the model. So this worked on a bunch of languages in Java. 
example. So it shows uh, the control flow on the left side. So as you step through, it'll show you what line of code is executed, which shows you know if statements, for loops, function calls, and so on. There are stack frames I wrote down here. So if you remember from intro classes, you have these you know, function calls or method calls or stack frames. Um, there are data structures. So this is a linked list data structure in Java. Um, this is JavaScript, uh, which is actually nothing like Java internally. Uh, that you can you know, visualize these things like object-oriented programming. So besides the traditional classes and instances, in JavaScript they use this thing that's called a prototype-based inheritance. So you can see the actual prototype chains moving up. So you can actually really illustrate these very uh, kind of obscure, well not obscure, they're, they're very fundamental language concepts in a, in a clear way. And if you don't have these diagrams, you just have to guess like what's going on here. Um, here's C and C++, so you can visualize these low-level pointer operations. This is a character buffer, and you can see these pointers in the middle, and you can see the stuff moving around. And again, this is all real code you can run, and it'll just kind of visualize. So um, this tool has had quite a bit of uptake over the past, this is eight years, it started around 2010, the first two years I didn't have a server of blogging. Um, but, you know, it's, the Python is still most of it, right, because this is how the site started, and it's probably, probably the most popular language online for teaching. Um, all the other languages combined, it's, you know, it, it's dwarfed by Python, but it actually, it's still, you know, we still have a few million kind of uh, samples here, because it's at that 40 million. So if you add the embedding, so you can actually embed these visualizations into other sites so that you can put it into courseware or textbooks and stuff, that just adds a few more. So it's around, you know, in the 50 million. So this is all naturalistic growth, right? So there's no advertising, I have no ad budget, I have like no budget of any sort, right? <laughs> I have like no money in my wallet. This is like absolutely, absolutely. Yep, shout when, when were the new languages introduced? As yeah, so here's a good question. They were introduced wherever, it was around 2015. Yeah, but as around that, right? Yeah, I mean, like all of them? Um, I rolled it out one at a time, but I think they were all around 2015, 2016. Yeah, okay. there's another graph I can share in the back of the slides with the languages. But yeah, they were, you know, they're still secondary right now. How do people find it? That's a great question. Um, it shows up really well in Google. Um, so if you search for Python, Tutor, JavaScript, Tutor, Visualizer, Help, whatever, it shows organically shows up pretty well. And then I think part of that is because people in these MOOCs, online courses, they link to it, you know, instructors link to it, the students on the forum say, oh, you know, check out this tool we're using. And I think at, once you see some of the later features, you'll kind of start seeing how it's organic. But there's like zero advertising or anything. Is it open source? Yeah, yeah, it's all, the code is all open source. And stuff. Cool. So um, this is a you know unique user by IP address, and I have some uh, local storage cookie thing as well. But it's around I would say around three and a half million. You know, kind of all time people who have used it. So and the graph goes back a bit. Um, you know, besides the you know up into the right uh, graphs, which which look cool. I, I the thing that excites me more besides numbers is just diversity of the user base. So this basically covers every country. Here's a log scale, color scale of. Um, the unique by country, and it, it basically covers everywhere in the world. Um, Central Africa is one notable exception, and I think there's a, you know, there are many challenges to getting uh, a lot of educational technology and tech in there, but most, you know, mostly North America and India are the, the biggest, Western Europe as well. So we have these lightweight surveys we put on the site, so most people are over 25 years old, so these are uh, not college or K-12 students. One six are over 55, so that's what motivated the older adult study. Um, majority are non-native speakers, uh, non-native English speakers. So, like this kind of this kind of base gives me the ability to do research on a, on a worldwide community of learners, um, and also it allows me to develop new systems that try to bring these in-lab interactions to the world. So, this is kind of you know it's, it's widely used as a nice platform for trying out new things. So, the first interaction I want to talk about is how students often work in pairs or small groups, right? So, in lab, you're often seeing people just kind of pair up and you know try to do stuff together. So can we bring this interaction outside a lab? Um, and this is the multi-user mode. So this was deployed around four years ago. So let's get the video up. And OK, so you can start this chat button, and then this will give you a unique URL. Just send it to someone, just like a Skype URL or whatever, just send, or Google Hangouts. Um, and then you can just chat. There's a bottom. There's a chat feature, and then you can visualize, you can run through the code together. You actually see each other's cursors. So like the left person's moving, you can see that the right person sees their cursor. So it's not like you're both in front of one computer. And then you can type as well and, and such. So yeah, these two people can be halfway around the world. Right? And then you can type, it's like a Google Docs um, simultaneously at anything. And then you can rerun again, and you can basically visualize the code together and talk about it. 
So this is like these sorts of online IDEs where you can write code together, but the, the main difference is the, the actual visualization that go along with it, which I think actually plays a, a really important role. Um, so once again, you start this chat button here. It generates a unique URL. Um, you have to know somebody, right? So you have to you know, send it to your friend. It's like basically a lightweight form of screen sharing. You send it to your friend or your TA or something. They join in. And the interaction that we're trying to emulate is this sort of pair programming thing. Right? So it's kind of remote pair programming or kind of playing with the, the code together. So the kind of natural questions we had from, from the data was, you know, can this remote pair programming in real time that emulate these sorts of real in-lab interactions? Um, do people actually chat about the visualizations? Like, are the visualizations actually useful for something? And then can people actually learn and feel some kind of a human connection from, from, from using it? So uh, I deployed this to the site. This is around mid-2014. Uh, I was deployed. And this is the total number of sessions that have been held. It's around in the low, around low thousands. So this, these are what I call substantive sessions. So this means that at least two people in the session each sent at least 10 chats or edited the code like at least 10 times. And, and the idea is that there's a lot of when we filter it out. When one person starts it, it's just a test or like they come in and it didn't work or anything. Um, we do the code edits one also because sometimes I notice that people don't chat, but they actually just use the code editor to chat. They're just communicating essentially through the code itself. Um, the chat sessions were you know, fairly substantive in length. So um, you know, the median is around 37 minutes. This is a distribution. It, so this is not just like us just sending one or two chats. This feels kind of like you're in lab and you're kind of working back and forth. Right? You're, kind of, you're actually doing something for at least some amount of time. Um, so uh, I had some students help me code up the chat logs like to kind of look at what they were doing in the chat log. And very informally, there was about a half and half split in the chat log between this one-on-one -on -one tutoring case and a peer learning collaboration case. And it was usually very clear which one it was. So the tutoring case is something like this, where the tutor says, our program crashed, what do you think? What structure, how about this, how about this, what's the type of stuff? And then the learner is like kind of filling it. So this is an example of a very good tutor, right? So like, you know, kind of trying to get them, an instructor or, or TA, whoever, trying to get them to figure out the problem, help them debug the problem. Um, the other cases were something like this, right? I thought you'd read it. So there's two people or more going back and, going back and forth. Um, so these cases were clearly like students working on a project together or pair programming or trying to debug a problem together. No one was clearly the, the lead or the tutor. Um, people learn by discussing these visualizations, or at least appear to. So um, the median for each set of session was around you know, 76 messages sent and 61 interaction visualizations. They're often error leaps. So you know, they, it wasn't just like they were chatting or they were playing visualizations. They were kind of coming in together. And um, just look in the chat log, this showed both kinds of major kinds of knowledge being transferred. So declarative knowledge is kind of like, what is this thing? I don't understand this concept. Just send me a link to this you know, feature. And procedural is more like step by step. How am I debugging this problem? How am I structuring this algorithm and so forth? Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the chats refer to visualizations. I'll read the standard. It says, reference is deleted, object stays, because another reference still in place, and a new reference doing the same thing being put in back place. So this sort of stuff you can't really talk about unless you have a visualization. Right? Because if you just have code or you're just editing together, it doesn't really engender these same kinds of conversations. So like that's why I felt that the visualizations were actually pretty critical for helping people, to helping people, you know, talk about stuff. And and the, the kind of takeaway from this first part is, you know, this statement that seems pretty obvious, but it's it's a visual representation of the power of discussion. Right? So by having an interface where you can not only visualize what's going on and have people chat about it and point to it, it gets people to talk about it and, and kind of learn more deeply. And the analogy I like to make is that, you know, if you think about, uh, for those of you, if you think about, you know, when you're first learning the code, you know, code really does look like this, right? I mean, it just looks just, you know, there's actually a view source from the YouTube website. So, okay, so you two are curious. So, like, it just looks like this, right? Just like, just a bunch of stuff. And it's like, what do you talk about? How do you parse it and decipher it? And by, I think by having these visualizations and figure out what's going on, you're turning code more like this from this into something in a visual form, right? That in a studio setting, you can actually talk about some shared medium. So are there any questions about the first part before I move on to the second part? Yes? Um, do you ever use the Python interpreter and breakpoints and, and encourage them to start pausing instead of just running it and then crashing, running, crashing? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the actual feature does use PDB. It does use Python breakpoints. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a way to actually set breakpoints in there as well, but that's a bit more advanced. But these programs are usually pretty short. So like they can just run it, and if it crashes, they'll just go back to the same place. 
Yeah, they're usually pretty short. Up so and back. What's the natural user behavior? You see, do people sign on every day? Do they use it once a week? That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of first-time users every day, um, and you know there are recurring users as well. I could, I have that data, I just haven't pulled it up too much. My just gut intuition is that you're in some class or in a MOOC or you're trying something out for a few weeks, and and then you're doing it as needed. I would say, yeah, I I, I think that's probably the intuition. Um, Stu, let's do one uh, here and then here. Have you seen some of the uh, stuff? Yeah. I'm just wondering if you get like maybe. Yeah, we can talk afterwards about that. Yeah, we can talk afterwards about it. We have the whole spiel on that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, I'm actually interested in how this visual representation actually scale with like more like longer and more complex code. Because yep. the examples you showed were like there's like some very novel like sort of simple concepts. Yeah. So so it, when it gets complex, how does what does it look like? Is 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 it are they helpful? And yeah. So the question about scale, both if the code gets you know, if it's 10,000 steps and if there's 10,000 data structures on the screen. Yeah, so the, the way to think about this is that it's a, it's a whiteboard model, right? Like, you can't fit 10,000 things on a whiteboard. So it's whatever fits on the whiteboard. Um, in reality, what actually happens is that you can decompose a lot of things into small test cases. So you can, if you structure it well, the small examples do give you a thing. And it kind of goes back to your question, too. Of, this is not meant for production debugging. It's not meant for like, here are the giant code base, we want to actually debug it. So it's very much not a production debugger. So it's like you take like a snippet that you want to understand and then you put yeah. that in there, visualize yeah. that so you have like fair understanding. Yeah, and also in classes, the examples are usually pretty small, right? I mean, for an educational setting, they're usually 50 lines okay. of code at most. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm going to jump on. We, I'm happy to stay around afterwards as well. So second point is connecting learners online. So what's the deal with all these single user sessions? So remember how I had this thing where um, we filtered by two people and they each had to attend chat. So there's actually a bunch of stuff in the log where there's one person chatting. And I'm like, what's the deal with that? Um, so it turns out that a bunch of these were like one person saying, oh, can someone help me? Is anyone here? And like, the rage quitting are like, people talk for a long time. <laughs> Self therapists here. Um, Nobody is here. Huh? There's a, the status is nobody is here. Yeah, actually, there's an instruction that there's an instruction that says you have to send this link. Right? I mean, there's a very explicit instruction that this is not a magical help site. No, yeah. Um, but people don't instruct it. So let's go back to the lab. Right? So what happens in a lab is that people put themselves on a help queue. So there's a help queue right here. I don't know if people here have seen blackboards. This is like a really like, 20th century, right? It's a blackboard, 20th century. <laughs> Um, how can we scale up this experience of you know, writing on the blackboard? Um, so here, there's a question about site traffic. So this is the daily active user. So this is uh, total, I would say around 6,000 a day. I mean, it goes up and down. This is very smooth. Um, half of them are actually first time people coming to the site. A lot of times organic searches and stuff. But it's grown a lot lately, right? So the last year or two, it's, it's grown a lot and from, from the early years. And I, I felt like I always wanted to do this, but I felt like just in the last two years, there's gotten to be enough people that this feature would actually work. So this is about almost a year worth of data. This is um, showing that there's usually around 50 or 100 people on the site at once. So this is per hour, aggregated over about a year. And this is a distribution of how, this is a median. So you know, it goes up and down. Um, the highest is midday in the US, I guess, and evening in Europe or somewhere. I mean, some, I think it's probably, Later in the evening in Europe, but and the lowest is middle of the night in the US, right? Still pretty US centered, but still you get a lot of people because it's worldwide. So considering there's a bunch of people on the site, um, the, the natural thing to try is to figure out if they can actually help each other. So here is the public health extension to the, to the tool. So uh, now we have you write code just like we did before. Now there's an actual public help button up here. So when you click that, it actually adds yourself to a queue, just like a just like a Blackboard queue. This is Del Mar, California. That's where my house is. And then now, anyone going on the site, they don't have to know your URL. This is just some random person on the site. They see the whole queue and they see you or me right here. Where is it? Yep, right there. And you can just click and join in. All right. So this will allow anybody on the site to join in, and you can chat and, and do whatever. And if you notice how the person who started the site. Uh, the session can close the door. They can kick people out. They can they can moderate. Right? So if you are asking for help, you can moderate your own session. You can kick people out. You can not let people in, so forth. And then this interaction is exactly the same as before, right? You're doing the chat. You're doing the visualizations, and so forth. So once again, there is a queue. The queue here shows. Oops, 
So you click the live help button. Um, there's already people on the queue here. Um, so everybody has a pseudonym here. Um, we didn't want people to have to generate their usernames and stuff. So um, there's a the pseudonym. There's a location. There's you know each room just shows how many people are currently in it. So it's like oh if there's already people here maybe you go in another room or maybe you want to jump in and join in. Um, this is me right here, California, and it's just a first come first serve queue, and then you know you, anyone else can see you. So the natural questions here are, uh, the first one is who volunteers to help? Why would people actually do this? It seems pretty random. Um, can they actually provide help in some way? And how does it compare to um, helping people that you already knew helping you? Uh, so we deployed this to the site. So this was the old deployment. Mode. This was the private chat mode where you had to know somebody. And I deployed the new one about six months ago, so November 2017. Um, I made this in kind of a frenzy, like a three-week frenzy. I don't know if I told people I broke my foot. <laughs> so I was house down for about a month, so I made this thing. It was very productive. <laughs> <laughs> and since it came out, I mean, the, the usage has skyrocketed kind of past the private one, right? Because the curve is just way higher because it's public, right? It's, it, it's, it's public, so anyone can join in. These are, again, are these substantive sessions with people who do even more than 20 chats. And these are total strangers, right? As far as I know, they're, they're total strangers. Um, and uh, and so the cool thing here is that it really connected people from around the world. So this is a you know spaghetti looking diagram here of um, these are people who've connected in these substantive sessions, and I only draw the ones from different countries. So, this is cool. so like every one of these links are linking people from different countries, and you know entirety of Europe is covered. If you if you show all of them, it would just be a mess because there's a lot within the same country. It would just be even more of a mess than it is now. And only showing international ones, you know, people from over 100 countries, you know. Over 3,000 of these sessions were international complete strangers. Um, if you're willing to wait on the queue, you'll probably get helped. Um, and the idea is it's kind of a first come, first serve queue. So if you're willing to wait and you're there, you know, you'll you'll have a decent chance. So if this is everybody on the queue, so only about a six get help total. Um, that's because a lot of people just leave early, right? You just get on there or you're trying it, you're probably not serious about it, and you just, you just leave. But we say on the instructions, like, you know, there's no guarantee someone help you. This is like free, uh, but just keep working. It's like you raised your hand and you put yourself on the queue. Is there a question? Yes. Is there a lot of help going in particular directions? Oh, like internationally. That's a really good thing to look at. I mean, both of these questions about um, usage and directionality, I think that's an awesome thing to look at. And um, I, I've seen some anecdotes about, because we display location as well, because it feels a little bit more humanizing, there are some people who actually join in because they notice someone from their city or their country and stuff. But that would be really interesting to see, uh, you know, a directional flow. Um, yeah, it's all in the data. I just don't know. I guess there's this thing. There's certain groupings that just work well. India is exactly the other yeah. side of the world from California. That would be California. awesome. Yeah, I would, I would love to see that. I mean, these are all great questions for um, to look into. And I would love, you know, this is just very early analysis, but it would be awesome. Yep. Um, when, you were making, when you were making a statement about um, maybe that you've observed users joining in to help yeah. because of like affiliation or affinity for a particular location, is that something that you explicitly saw in the data, or is that like an inferred um, that an inference? That was, uh, so we have a little survey, which I'll give you a little bit. So one of the surveys just kind of pops up when you join in and just asks a one line, oh, why did you decide to help at this time? And some people said very few, though. It wasn't like major, but some people just said, oh, because I saw someone from my country or state. And then you saw in some of the chats, like, oh, you're from whatever province or something. Got it. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't a huge effect, I think, but it was, you know, it was self -aware. Okay, cool. Thanks. Cool. Um, so this is a curve for if you're willing to stick around, basically you have you know over half chance of, of getting help and stuff, and that's just just a numbers game, right? Just around and more people coming in. It turns out if you actually don't go idle, you have a really good chance. of this, these are the people who stuck around and never went idle uh, for more than ten minutes. So idling means that if you just don't do anything, if you're away from your keyboard or you're just you know browsing Facebook or whatever, um, it will gray you out after a few minutes. I think it's after three. So I give them a generous range, and that's because you don't want people just staying on and then like. The, the last thing you want is if you join in and help, someone's not actually there, right? So it's kind of annoying. So if you're idle, if you haven't been typing and doing stuff, it will just push you down and say idle so that people hopefully join the non-idle. So if you're not idle, you actually have a very good chance of someone coming in. And in fact, this is really interesting. So 4% of these sessions had helpers who are themselves on the queue now, right? So this is the idea of I'm just chilling and waiting and like might as well just jump in for someone else because maybe they can. And I actually saw some. 
I have to look at the chat logs in way more detail. Um, but like, there are some cases where like someone jumps in and it's like, oh, you know, I actually I need help as well. So maybe we can like work together. And maybe you scratch my back, and I scratch your <laughs> sort of thing. Um, uh, mostly, it's one helper, right? Most sessions had one person actively chatting. There were a few. Uh, There's some interesting outliers, um, but mostly it's one person jumping. So once one person jumps in, they're really in. And no one else really is. But there's there's always a few lurkers, which I think is really interesting. So these are people who are in the session but are not chatting. So these are people who are just hanging around, they're in the session. I mean, you could kick them out if you want, but a lot of people just don't. Maybe they don't notice because they're not if they're not being disruptive, they're not doing anything. Um, I think this is really fascinating because if you think about it in like office hours or in a lab, oftentimes you do you know the TA is going somewhere over some of the student. You have other people just hanging out, right? And that's actually a really good learning experience because some students might be shy; they might not want to ask the question. But like watching someone help someone else is actually immensely powerful. Um, I mean, that's like I mean, uh, Twitch is a great example. Watching other people play video games is immensely addictive, and watch and it's true. Watching other people like get help or like code and stuff is. Surprisingly, I mean, there's more live coding on Twitch now too. We can talk about later. But like this Voyager is surprisingly addictive. And in fact, 11% of these sessions had so my English is not great here, but 11% of the sessions had a helper who had previously worked. So that means that like I was lurking before and I was just you know creeping around, and then I feel like oh this seems legit, and then I actually go and help someone later on. So I think this is actually really really neat. So why do people volunteer? So these are the little mini surveys I put in. So when you volunteer, you can optionally just fill out a question. You don't have to. Um, a big one is to take a break from their own work. So these are people who are on the site who are working on some problem or debugging or something. It's just like you're in lab. And it's like, oh, I just want to see what's going on, right? Like, I'm kind of stuck. Let's see what's going on. So 70% of sessions had helpers who later requested help. So these are people who helped, and then they later also requested help themselves. So they're kind of, it's implying that they are also learners on the site. Um, paying a forward is another one, right? So this is actually way more, it's almost a third. So these are people who asked for help in the past, they got help, maybe they got help, and then they like decide to help out, right? So these are, you know, I got help, that was just kind of cool, and then they said in the survey, oh, you know, I got help in the past, it seems kind of like, kind of cool to pay forward. And there were some instructors and actually professionals who were just volunteering for fun. There were people who were like, you know, there were actually professional developers on there, it's kind of, it's like, you know, the early days of Stack Overflow before it became like, Super gamified. There were people actually on there because they were they felt like good about helping out and stuff. So there were act, there were actual TAs on there. So how do strangers compare to friends? This is very preliminary, but like I would love to do. I think in the coming months I'm going to have some students help me do a really detailed analysis of these two corpuses where we have people who know each other who use this interface and people who don't know each other and how they differ. Very anecdotally, there's more tutoring, less peer to peer because it makes sense because you're asking for help because you want to be tutored, not if you don't know someone that works with you. Um, usually these failures come really fast. So like, you know, basically as long as you make it over 20 chats, the sessions are pretty substantive, right? Like they, they're, they're pretty substantive sessions. And that, that's not to say that everyone's successful. So there's a lot of failed sessions. Um, that's why the success rate isn't like 100%, right? But there's a lot of sessions where someone joins in and they say like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm just gonna leave or sorry or whatever. So, you know, it's fine because they leave and other people might join in. Um, and there's actually very little bad behavior. So this is something that was a big concern early on. I think in like, you know, we're opening this up. This is me like chat roulette or something, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like you're opening this up to anyone to potentially do anything on. And um, and I was I kept a very close eye on this. And I think the reason why there's very little bad behavior so far is that there's not really an incentive for doing anything, right? It's all private. It's all anonymous. There's no state. You're not like posting any spam to a forum. You're not like. There's no pictures. There's like it's just text and code. There's really not any like real giant motivation. I mean, occasionally have people there who mess around, and we have this really simple moderation feature. So the person who starts a session can kick anybody out. Once they get kicked out, they kind of get banned. So like, once you get if you get kicked out of a session, then um, you can't see that session ever unless you like install a new browser and go to. Site, right? Maybe like, so like, change your IP address, change your browser, blah, blah. You can't see them. And then you can just easily undo their actions. So if someone like comes in and like erases your code or something, you just kick them out and you just undo their changes. So this has been okay so far. Also, like, there are not that many people on it, right? This is the size of like Reddit or YouTube comments. You need a lot more moderation. I purposely made this so you don't really need much, but they can self moderate. So the conclusion from this part, from moving to the last part, is that the shared context really facilitates anonymous help. Like, I think the reason why this actually works pretty well is because people are on the site to do a certain thing, right? They're here because they're students, or they're trying to figure out how to debug something, or they're learning a new language, and they're trying to like 
paste and code snippets and, and figure stuff out. And they have the shared context, right? So it's like this uh, woodworking example or the makerspace example. People are here because they're doing this stuff. So they don't necessarily have to know each other. People just pair up and help each other. They don't really know who each other is oftentimes, but they have the shared context to be able to help each other out. So I think this is, you know, you know, in, in the in the kind of scale of the internet being a good place or a bad place, I think that you know we, we can make this a fairly good place in the internet because of this this tightly uh, coupled context. So questions before I move on to the last part. Yes. Uh, is there a, like have you noticed that people ask for help when uh, their code isn't compiling, or is it just like I want to learn how this works? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we have. All, we have all the data about the code compilations and, and errors and everything. I just have not correlated any of that. It's something maybe I can hire you again. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, volunteering. I mean, should work with me on a project at MIT that was very similar to that. But yeah, that, that's a great, that's a great thing to do. Right? Just see, you know, when do people struggle? Like, is it like you hit compile five times and like you throw up your hands? And it will actually, uh, that'll actually relate to the, the later one. But yeah, I have not this bit of data. Other questions? Yes. Have you considered a more asynchronous model? Um, you have oh, so, so what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's uh, good. Well, I mean, the, it's awesome that you can log on and just get almost like a real time synchronous session. But uh, if you're from the tutor perspective, probably gets repetitive to answer the same question over and over again. And so it's a way to better harness that to more like a knowledge base. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that will actually come into play in the last part. But the short answer is no, because it's all synchronous. But I think that the reporting of prior answers or prior patterns and replaying them or putting them in a knowledge base would be really interesting. So, so far, people are under their understanding of their chapter privacy. I don't want to, you know, expose that, but you can imagine curating some, like manually curating them and then analyzing them and stuff. But I think that's a great idea, but this is all synchronous. Question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have any doubt about what causes people to maybe give up or stop emissions, um, like certain problems or? Oh, you mean they ask for help and they yeah, just they ask leave? for help, like, that's, that's a great thing as well. Just, like, exit the system and then try to learn. Yeah, yeah, that's a great. I mean, all of these things are. I mean, uh, you know, all of you have PhD because all these things are like no, seriously, like all these things are great research questions, and we have the data to show that, and they're um, they're great questions. It's just yeah, <laughs> short answer is, is no. Other questions for you? Uh, yep. If you consider recording sessions and then potentially allow people who go through the same problem to see a video. Yeah, and, and that's similar to the asynchronous one back there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, 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 it's great. I, I think I would definitely consider them. I mean, currently, as the site stands, I probably don't want to do that because sort of people are expecting their chapter private, right? They probably don't want to expose them publicly. But imagine a future version in a class where you're opting in to recording your stuff. I think that'll be great. Here and here. Do they have a way to stay in touch after a reception? Yeah. And then, like, this is my pool of buddies who I stay in touch with. And Second question is, do they also talk about things not related to code? Yeah, yeah, these are, this is really awesome. So the first one is um, people actually just end up, you know, at the end of the session, because this is all anonymous, they would say, like, can I get your email address? Or, like, you know, how can I reach you on Skype or on whatever? So then, you know, then they reach outside. And maybe they come back on the site, right, later. Um, so there is no sort of account system, if you know. We can talk much later about why there isn't. Like, there's no account system. There's no persistence. So, like, all these things would be great to build in. If, uh, but. But not this one. And the second one is that you talk about stuff other than code. And the answer is, and, and that actually is the contrast. I feel like, just anecdotally, the, uh, not, the strangers don't, but the friends do, right? The friends actually do a lot of just random time because they're just friends chatting. Um, but the strangers, I don't think as much. Um, but maybe they do. Yeah. This is a potential, this is a potential can of worms, but for yeah. the, your thought about having people opt in to building or accumulating a, a set of recorded sessions, I wonder. Whether you thought about the um, having however many people in the chat all kind of reach consensus about whether they want to showcase their session or not, like that is a potential way where like someone had a really satisfying debugging session, they they maybe would want to share that. And yeah, that and that's why I didn't explore that. Yeah, I, I didn't explore the recording because exactly like because you would need to have everyone opt in to record it and such. And but it was it's just not, two people. Yeah, but it's just two people, and they both have to. But yeah, so that's why I've not touched all those those cans of worms. Yeah, those cans have not been open. Uh, okay, so let's do the last part. We have about 10, 12 minutes to do the last part. So the last part is making experts multitask. This is a little bit shorter. I'll go over this a little more quickly. Um, going back to our lab, we have uh, the Blackboard help queue. Um, and, you know, oops. So what the instructors do is that there's oftentimes instructors who monitor the queue, right? It's not just students. There's actually TAs and instructors walking around. 
And um, and so, you know, there's one around here, or just lingering around there. But there was actually far fewer instructors and learners anyway, right? I mean, just just as a, as a fact. So the, the question here is, how much can we scale up a single expert? How much can we possibly stretch a single expert? So this is a, a poor uh, TA running around, you know, underpaid grad student running around, uh, you know, supervising all these students. And, you know, we want a way for them to be able to monitor the students a bit better in, in their classes. So, you know, uh, the, the conceptually what we want to do is have a thing where there's a tutor in the middle and they're monitoring all of their computers as they're doing. So I call this the code opticon, it's kind of like a can opticon. Um, and it's a one to many real time interface. So I want to illustrate how this code opticon thing works with one to one. So imagine just have one learner and one tutor. Uh, and here's a, uh, a video. So this will play twice. The first time is looking at the left, will second time look at the right. So this is a learner. So this is the Python tutor site. They're on there. They're like the made up example. But so, so making a product function, x, y, like, oh, let's call it a, b. And then how do you multiply? You use the multiplication sign in, 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 in math, right? That's the capital X, and then you do that. Um, and then you can visualize. There's some weird error. You don't know what's going on. So then you can do the lowercase x. It looks like multiplication as well. And so on. OK, so let's same, same video. The right side is what the tutor sees now. So the tutor sees a compressed view with these uh, chunks of uh, keystrokes coming in, chunks at a time. So this is exactly what the user's typing. When they're erasing, it flashes red to show they're erasing. And then they add A and B. And then they, uh, they write this thing. And when they try to compile and run, it will show the error that they're doing. So it shows the error, and it shows the line. And then it shows them revising it and stuff. So as a tutor, you see a little rectangle for each learner. And, do that. and then you can now go back in history. So this is a history slider now of all the edits that this person has been doing. And you go back and forth and say, oh, well, they made a like, weird multiplication there now. So if you want to chat with them, you can actually open this chat box now inside, and I'll send the chat there. So you can push your chats. Um, this is kind of opposite of before where someone was asking for help. This is the tutor kind of pushing the help to them if they want. Um, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if only all interactions are so polite. <laughs> so, uh, like Mr. Roger, maybe. Um, so this is one person, right? So the summary of one person is this rectangle here. It summarizes their code, there's a history, there's a little chat box and such. So to scale this up to a lot of people, we just tile these. So we just simply make an interface where we just tile all of these together. Um, so if you have a big monitor, you can actually fit like 15 of them. Um, so it, it looks kind of overwhelming, but actually it, it, it sort of actually works. So um, the, you, you want to monitor everything in real time, right? So every so it, it, this is actually working the way it is. It's working like everybody's just editing, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's like you're an air traffic controller. Um, the history slider is really important because you're not going to see everyone's edits in real time, right? So if you see someone with an error, you're like, oh, well, let's go back and see what they were doing. So that's essential. And then the key thing here is you can chat with anyone you want, right? So you have this monitoring interface where without leaving your screen, you can just chat with a bunch of people. Um, and what if there's more than 10 people? Um, the intuition is that not everyone is active at once, right? If you have 50 people in a room or 100 people in a room, not everybody is furiously typing away at once. They may be stopped, they may be off task, maybe we're browsing Facebook or YouTube, and, um, and we'll show who's idle and who's not. So once again, we have the real-time activity traces, and the interface kind of pushes people up who are more recently active. So a really simple heuristic is that when you're glancing at the screen, you should see the people who are the most active, and then the people who are idle are just kind of down. And then if they become active, they push up. So the questions here are, how many learners can a single tutor handle comfortably? It's like chess. Yeah, like chess, yeah. It's like Fathom playing speed chess. <laughs> like 20 people blindfolded. Um, and can tutors actually help people learn? And how does this code often compare to actually real life tutoring in the lab? So I'm going to really briefly summarize the user study. So I did this user study with um, eight of the staff for an intro Python class. At, um, this is back at Rochester many, many years ago. Um, and we actually had them go on the site and actually tutor people who were on the site. So these are actually like real live people they don't know right, on the site who are doing all sorts of things. Like they don't even know what they're doing. And um, they can monitor around 100 people because there's usually around 100 on the site right, when they're when they're being active. Um, and they can help about three of them at once. That's the basically the limit. You can't really chat with more than three people at once, like it's, uh, unless you're like uh, you know a teenager or whatever. You really can't chat with. <laughs> I can't tell more than one person at once. So, uh, but the key here is not everyone's active, right? Like the, the, the whole power of this interface is that it lets you see everything and prioritize accordingly. And 
the fact that you know there's a distribution, right? Most people are not active all the time. So it just lets you more efficiently, you know, more efficient than running on loop. So this turns out to be really good for little nudges, right? So these nudges to get boxes unstuck, these kind of oftentimes, you know, if you go up to someone to help them, there's probably something obvious you see that, you know, you just ask them, oh, you know, why do you look at this line? Kind of thing, or look at this documentation for this thing. Right? But it's it trades off depth for quantity, right? Like you really uh, you really can't go deep with anyone because you're kind of looking around for a lot of uh, people. And the final one here is that the tutors really felt enterprise by this multitasking, right? It's because there's less idle time. Because oftentimes when you're in a lab, you're either idle or one person asks for help or a bunch of people are asking at once. And this, you know, this felt, you know, at least for a while, it felt like you know you can actually do this. And and the best evidence of this thing, basically everyone wanted kept going. Like we did the study around 30 minutes, and so we just had them go on for 30 minutes. And like everyone just wanted to keep going because they, they were in the middle of helping people, right? So like they didn't want to actually stop. So the, the key idea here is that this real-time scaffolding helps experts multitask. Like, you know, there's a lot of literature about how you know, people actually can't multitask, and I think for most things it's true. But I think for this sort of simple sort of interaction where you're an expert and you just need to help a bunch of people out in a very light, uh, light touch way, I think having a scaffold interface, this monitoring interface, will, will help people do that. So imagine you know, in a physical environment like this, you, it's very hard to get into the slide instructors standing around. But imagine in a digital environment, we can actually uh, do this sort of monitoring. So I'm going to finish. So there's like two more slides, and then we'll take questions, and then other. You know, I'm I'm, I'm hanging around for a bit afterward until uh, until probably like two or so or whenever we're going to copy. <laughs> Hang around. Um, so the, the 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 you know questions I've been trying to address in my work is how can we scale these authentic, hands-on, real-time interactions? And there's three big ideas here about visual representations, empowering discussion. Uh, about shared context, facilitating anonymous help, and then real-time scaffolding helping experts multitask. So I think these sorts of systems I've been building on top of Python 2 that really are trying to explore the space of what it mean to have a scalable sorts of world where people are at the center of it, and that you know learning online is less about this kind of gross walls of text without the human connection, and we really want to bring um, kind of learning coding online into something more like this sort of what you learn perhaps in students, and then more generally I think. I think we need to figure out ways to scale authentic human-to-human um, -human interaction. I think this is actually, I mean, this is one of my few soapbox slides in the end, but like, you know, with you know, with a lot of the stuff with AI and machine learning coming up, I and mean, people talk about scaling, both in learning and just in like work and everything. I think a lot of it just seems like we're working toward this dystopian future where people are just, you know, enslaved or out of the picture. And I think that, you know, the way I think we could really use machines is to figure out how do we scale up these really authentic human-to-human -human interactions where we really feel a human connection with each other, and we can do it remotely. So this project is all on GitHub. Um, there's a ton of people to acknowledge. Um, one of my Europe's was a postdoc, Irene, um, she's at Google now, um, helped work on this. And there's a lot of instructors along the way who have helped out in, um, in, in kind of uh, things. And we will report security vulnerabilities, which is great, uh, because I'm not a security person. So I'm very thankful for people reporting security vulnerabilities, because it's very important to be very nice to them. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there's a bunch of instructors from MIT and from, from elsewhere who've um, helped out along the way. So one soapbox slide, which I am actually on a soapbox, so this, this is a crappy paper. This is me in grad school for six years, no furniture. So for those of you who want to do your PhD, this is the life to expect. Uh, this is actually us moving. Uh, this is in Cupertino, like a temporary short-term lease. Um, this is when I started working on the Python 2 almost 10 years ago, and, um, and, and no furniture. And now I do have furniture, um, and you know this is mostly, for the most part, I mean it's a single developer open source project. Um, this is actually one of my obsessions is figure out how to sustainably fund open source software, and um, and I think I'm one of the few examples of a single maintainer project that's reached this level of scale. And um, and and unfortunately, I think most people who are in this position can't really sustain uh, this sort of scale. I mean, fortunately, I have a I have a day job and I get paid, you know, and I I, I, I can make a living. Um, and, and you know we have a bunch of traditional research grants. I have a whole group of grad students. Um, I have anywhere from four to six PhD students at once, and I haven't even gotten to talk about any of their work um, in, in the stock. But like, you know, the, the kind of how research grants work in academia is that they're really funding, um, you know, studies and scientific research and, and things, and they're not really funding infrastructural work like this. So like, you know, this stuff can fund like a lot of the studies I was doing on the work, but like in order to actually maintain it. And build it. I think a, a thing that you know I kind of got my soapbox on is that we really do need more flexible sources of, of, of funding um, to sustain these sorts of projects in the, in the coming decades. And like people, 
really thought a lot about different models. I mean, there's philanthropy, there's corporate donation and gifts, um, there's like trying to try to be a YouTube star or whatever, <laughs> getting ad money. Um, but I think this is going to be really important looking forward. I mean, just not be on, just be on this project because a lot of our um, internet infrastructure, a lot of our, I mean, especially thinking about uh, folks building products, like think about how much of it is built on free software and oftentimes maintained by very few people. So I, I'm very fortunate. I, mean, I, I have nothing to complain about because I have a day job, I get paid, and I have grants to fund. My students and my students don't have to have no furniture. My students have furniture, I think. Um, so um, that's it for my talk. We're almost at one. I'm happy to take questions now, or if folks want to disperse or eat and stuff, I'm, I'm just I'm happy to be around. So thank you all very much. Thanks.